Amen. So the title of my message tonight is Discerning the Soul versus the Spirit. That's what I want to talk to you about. I will tell you that we're going to, this is going to be some deep thought involved in this. You know, some people would say, oh, no, but the gospel is simple. I've heard that said many a time. It, the gospel is very simple. It's a simple message. You know, it, it's a very simple message, actually. But i got to tell you something. If you read the Apostle Paul's letters and you try to dig into what he's saying, some of the things that he did. You, know you know why I had to get into this complicated information? Can I tell you why? Because we don't, we don't submit to the simplicity of the gospel. That's why. That's what I believe. We don't submit and surrender to the simplicity of the gospel. So therefore, the Holy Spirit, through the Apostle Paul, had to explain to us in great detail various aspects having to do with things because mankind, as a general rule, now don't get mad at me when I get to preaching because I'm just getting started. Okay, don't get mad. Come on now, let the preacher preach, right? You came into a church. You didn't come here to wait for a social gathering, right? That's the other church, 45 miles down the road. That's not this church. Hallelujah. And this church, you came here tonight because you wanted to exalt the name of Jesus. I believe that. And you wanted to hear the truth of God's word. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to let the word of God speak tonight. Hallelujah. And listen, sometimes people, it just is what it is. We, we, we refuse to submit to the will of God. But, you know, God is used to this. It's a sad thing for me to say what I'm about to tell you. God is used to his people not listening to his word. Well, what are you talking about, preacher? You read the Old Testament, read the New Testament, and then look, I don't have to talk about you. I look at my own life. I look at my own life, and I'm like, this is sad. That for as long as I've been knowing you and living for you, and as many times as I didn't do what I was supposed to do, and even though I knew what I was supposed to do and still didn't do it, listen to me, Christian, I don't want to be that guy anymore. I want to be the guy that submits to the will of the Lord, that surrenders, hallelujah, that can hear his voice and will walk with him. That's what I want to be. Hallelujah. So we're talking about this, discerning the, the, the soul Versus the spirit. Yeah. And look, I'll, I'll put that little, that, see that, I just added that big spirit there. The other one's lowercase. Because really what I'm talking about is you need to be able to know the difference between your soul and, and your spirit. There's two different, they're not exactly the same thing. Soul and the spirit are not exactly the same thing. They both make up the inner man. We're going to get into this. But listen, you also need to understand that if you are a born again Christian, then the Holy Spirit is one with your spirit. I've been saying that a lot lately, but I need you to understand where the Holy Spirit, where God, do you understand that if you are a born again, I'm going to use a fancy Christian word, regenerated, Titus 3, 5. If you are regenerated by the blood of the Lamb, if you've been washed and renewed through the moving and operation of the Holy Spirit that was done through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, that means that the old has passed away, all things have become new, and the Holy Spirit has made your heart His home. Hallelujah. You have become the temple of the living God. Yes. The Spirit has been made one with your spirit. And He lives inside your spirit. I want you to know that. Amen? And so, so what we're going to talk about tonight is the soul versus the spirit. But my, my desire, I believe the desire the Lord put on my heart is that we would also understand how the word works in conjunction with this. So the soul versus the spirit. And you may not be able to read this, but I'm going to read it to you. I want, I hope tonight that you will become more aware of the difference, or I will also, more aware of the difference between our soul and the spirit. More aware of how the mind, the will, and the emotions of the believer, because I need you to understand this. That's literally, if you look it up in the Greek, the definition of the soul. Mind, will, and emotions. All right? Of the believer can both influence daily decisions and even, hear me now, even suppress God's voice in our life. Our own mind, our own will, even though we're saved, even though we love Jesus, can suppress the Spirit of God, can suppress the voice of God, and we will not be able to hear Him as clearly as what He desires us to. Can, can I just say this in case I forget? The Holy Spirit wants to possess you. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I said it. The Holy Spirit wants to possess you. He wants to take over your vessel. He wants to speak to you, and he wants you to bid, to listen to him, to surrender to him, and he wants to be able to send you on an 
an assignment, my friend. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And he wants you to be used by him. To bring love. To bring a hope to a lost and a dying world. That's what the Holy Spirit wants to do. I hope that when it's all said and done, that you will be able to better, or I will be able to better recognize the voice of the Spirit and yield to his voice, allowing him to take his proper place in our lives and influence our daily decisions. I want the Holy Spirit to influence me. I want him to speak to me, and I'm going to listen to him. Yes. Amen. Amen. So we're going to talk about the word. Amen. And in the word, I want you to know that I think it's important. We're not going to cover all these little points right here, but I'm just going to read this out to you. That it's important for us to understand the whole counsel of God's word in our lives. I just got to tell you that coming to church twice a week is not enough for you. You got to put the word of God in your heart for yourself. You got to trust me when I tell you this. I'm going to talk about some things. Sometimes I preach the, the gospel in such a way that you, if you don't know who Abraham is, come on, somebody. How can I preach on Abraham? But I'm going to slow it down and tell you, by the way, who's Abraham? Before there ever was a nation called Israel, God called a man out of Iraq. And he said, I'm going to make a name, a nation out of you. Hallelujah. Leave your father's house. I'm going to make, why? Because your daddy is an idol maker. And I'm about to set you free from idolatry. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. People still bound up by idolatry today. Well, what you talking about? You talking about that Mary statue and my grandma's? No, well, that's one too. But that's not what I'm talking about. I ain't scared to call it out, friend. It is what it is. That ain't even the real Mary. How you know? Because the real Mary ain't trying to get worship like that. The real Mary said, my soul doth magnify the Lord my God. Now I'm talking about all that and other idols in our life. All them other things that we turn to when life gets bad and we look to. All them other things that's in the way between you and me getting to Jesus. All them relationships, one after the other. To all oh, help us, Lord. All them drugs, all that alcohol, all them things that we turn to, all them idols, the Lord wants to set us free. Amen. He wants the word of God will renew our mind. Do you know you listen, you oh you go to that church where they they they're doing some brainwashing. No, it ain't no brainwashing. I know I keep saying it, y'all bored. We're washing brains. We're not brainwashing, we're trying to wash our brains. Yes. Trying to get our head right, renew our mind, and let it line up to the Word of God instead of this crazy world that we live in. Right. TikTok, Facebook, oh Lord Jesus, help me. Secular music, people get mad at me when I start talking about all this stuff, but I'm just trying to tell you right now. You keep on feeding your spirit all that garbage and see and wonder why you end up where you end up. I came here tonight to tell you the truth. You, you start thinking it's normal for your kid to be a girl when he's really a boy if you keep listening to that garbage. You, oh, Lord, you're thinking that the Lord made him Adam and Steve instead of Adam and Eve if you keep listening to that garbage. You ain't supposed to talk like that in this society. I'm here to tell you the truth of the word of God. I'm not here to bow down to the lying voice of the world. I'm here to tell the truth. America's in the vine, my friend. America is in a bind, and we, God, people need to wake up, get filled up, and start telling the truth. He wants to reveal God's mind to us. The Word of God will reveal God's mind to us. It will reveal His heart to us. It reveals the will of God to the heart of man. The spirit of the believer and the spirit of God are made one at salvation. Without God's Word, we have no way to know God's will. We, we're supposed to yield to the Spirit of God. And if when we yield, what does that mean? We let Him have the right of way. Yes. When we yield to the Spirit of God, it'll increase our sensitivity to the voice of God. But, but, is it, but I know I'm not going to yield. I'm going to punch you. I'm going to punch you, Lord. Ooh, I'm going to beat you. I'm going to beat you to the punch. I'm going to cut you off. I'm going to do it my way, Lord, because I know I, I got it from here. I got a premiere. I'm not ready to give you the wheel yet. Help us. The written word and the whisper. I want to talk to you about the written word and the whisper before it's over. But look, one of the beautiful things about the word of God, I love this. I'm not going to spend too much time on it. It will re-enculturate your mind. Have you been enculturated by the world around you? No, I'm serious. Do you think it's normal? Oh, Lord, help us. Do you think it's normal behavior? You know, back whenever I lived in the 80s and we hung out at the 
I said, but I don't even know if that place is still there. The strip and laugh behind, whatever in the world was in there. It was just normal commonplace. Like, what did you do? You went over there, you got liquored up, and you found a girl that looked good, and tried to smile at her and see if she'll smile back. And oh Lord, nobody knows what will happen. You know, if you live that way long enough, you'll start thinking that's normal behavior. And I'm here to tell you, the word of God says something different. The word of the Lord will reinculturate your thinking if you'll let Him. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Praise God. So when he speaks, I don't know if you can even see them little emojis. One of them speaking, the other one's saying, shh. When the Holy Spirit speaks, see right now I'm talking about the whisper. We're going to get into that towards the end. The whisper. It's a beautiful thing to know that the God of glory has been visiting our services. I know he's supposed to visit every service. I get that. But I'm just trying to tell you, when I can feel it more and more, I'm like, Thank you, Jesus, because I'm not going to take it for granted because I'm trying to tell you the same guy that the same God that formed Adam out of clay has been showing up. And I want to reverence his presence and I want to thank him. Hallelujah. But I want more. Well, you're getting kind of selfish. No, no, I want more because I need more. Why do you need more? Because I got to tell more people about his goodness and I can't do it on my own. If I don't have the help of the Holy Spirit. My words are going to fall like lead balloons on the ground. I need the anointing of the Holy Spirit. You need the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Because you're supposed to take Jesus outside these walls, my friend. So are we telling him to speak or are we telling him, shh? I want to hear that, Lord. I'm not ready right now. Dude. I'm not going to say who. Obviously, that would be not good. I'm not going to say where. I just had a conversation with somebody recently, and they were like, I know exactly where I am, and I ain't ready yet. Can I pray with you? Can I, I ain't ready yet. I'm not, I know where I am. I'm not ready. I don't want that right now. Lord, help us. So you know what I did? That's fine. I did. I ended up talking anyway, because the next time I saw them, then they, it wasn't quite as strong. So now, though, I'm done, I think I'm done talking, unless the Lord says something there, and I've just been praying. 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 Lord, touch him. You get it? Right? Amen. Hallelujah. The whisper. I want to talk to you before we're done about the whisper. So we're getting into the soul here. But before we do, I want to share a couple of scriptures with you. I want to share um, Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, because we're going to talk about the soul. All right? You ready? Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. I want to try to explain the soul to you. The word of God says, And the Lord God formed a man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. The soul is not the same thing as the spirit. Your soul, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but your soul has to do with your individuality. It describes who you are. Yeah. And I know we've been talking a lot about that, but I really want you to get that in your heart and in your mind, that the soul, a big part of the soul, it's, it's much deeper than that, but it's what makes you different than me, right? You are you and I am me. But listen, it's not just about the soul. I want you to also see something about the spirit, how the word of the Lord talks about this. It is sown a natural body, talking about human being bodies. It is raised a spiritual body. There's a natural body. There is also a spiritual body. He's talking about the glorified body. Do you know that you could live your whole life on earth seeking your own pleasure and what you want and then and then maybe get saved right at the end, right? And you and you make it in, but then you find out that you lived your life for a bunch of nothingness, right? And you don't receive the reward that God had planned for your life. Now that's a hard man. Now I'm gonna be preaching on that probably Sunday, part of it. I'm gonna preach on the drink offering, and I'm gonna preach on the, the judgment seat of Christ before coming up soon. But but I want you to know this: it, that's a hard message to preach in the world we live in. And what do you mean? When you're preaching to people that maybe aren't saved or sold out to the Lord, it's hard to it's hard for us to be pulled away from the world. Right. It's a very difficult thing for us to be pulled away from the world when we're kind of like lukewarm in the faith. Because, see, I'm having to, by the grace of God, the anointing of the Holy Spirit to communicate to you what the Word of God says, that there's an eternity that you and I will face. Right. No, really, it's going to happen. 
When we breathe our last breath here and we take our first breath there, and we, if we make it into the kingdom because we truly were saved, because we truly did believe in the fact that Jesus died on the cross for our sin, and that because he paid the sin debt, he resurrected. If all that's true and we make it in, but we squandered our time on earth because we were living for our own pleasures, we're going to find out we didn't really have very much to give him. We're going to find out that, that, our, that our reward... Was, was very little, and that, and I don't know about you, but the closer I get to the Lord, the more I want to give Him. The more I realize He gave me, the more I want to give Him. Amen? Amen. Praise God. So it's sown a natural body, but it's raised a spiritual body. There's going to be a glorified body. Amen? There's a natural body, there's a spiritual body. And this is what I want you to see. So it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Hallelujah. King James for quickening, that's old English, it means life. He's a life-giving spirit. Jesus now seated at the right hand of the Father. He prayed before. He said, I, I will pray to my Father, and he will send another comforter, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth. The world doesn't know him, but you know him, and he will, because he's been with you, but he will be in you. The Holy Spirit yeah. of God lives on the inside of you, my friend. Yeah. Hallelujah. And Jesus, what he did for us on the cross, allowed that to happen. And the life-giving Spirit of God has been released. And he wants to live inside of our hearts and lives. He doesn't want us just living according to our, in the soulish realm. Amen? So here's our body and our soul. I want, look, I don't want to get into this too much as we talked about it a good bit. But again, I just want to remind you that our soulish man is made up of our mind, our will, and our emotions. Right? And, and I do want you to see, though, this is that how the soul is close in this. I mean, this is just, you can't say that this is really what it looks like. This is just an illustration. But I do, but I do believe there's truth to this, that the soul is close to the spirit, but it's also close to the body. In other words, it's connected in a way to our external life, but it's also connected very closely to our spirit man. Okay, and I'm going to explain that a little bit more. I got some other little icons up here. I want you to know that the soul, I didn't mean that to look demonic. I was just looking for a brain to do. I know, it kind of looks weird. I'm not trying to be new agey on you. I'm just letting you know. All right, work with me. So the soul, you see how the soul is big right here and the spirit's small? That's not how the Lord wants this. And many times believers are walking and they're living their life in this way. But the soul is self, it's me, right? And I'm, I use the, this brain picture to try to describe because the soul, again, is made up of the mind, the will, and the emotion. Then the spirit is deep down inside of me. And see, the spirit of God, I'm using the dove right there. It's he and me. So it's in my spirit that the Holy Spirit lives in me. I know I've already said that. If I was going to use a body part to describe the spirit of man, I would probably say Philippians 2, 1, and it talks about the Greek word is, I can't even pronounce it, splankanon. It's where we get the word spleen. It's talking about your innards, your bowels, way, way, way down deep on the inside of you is where the Holy Spirit is. He says, if there's any fellowship of the Spirit, any bowels of mercy. See, the Holy Spirit lives way, way down deep on the inside of you. I want you to know that the Spirit, uh, hallelujah, wants to, again, he wants to control us. I do. I want to say this. This is where it gets kind of deep. I want you to know that the brain and the mind, that there's a difference. There's a difference between the brain and the mind, and there's a difference between the body and the members. Now, if you're not used to, if you're not used to Bible words, this might throw you off. But Paul uses the word mind, and he uses the word members. These words have added meaning. They're not just talking about physical body parts. He's using them in a spiritual context. There's a difference between the brain and the mind, and there's a difference between the body and the members. When the Holy Spirit, through the Apostle Paul, uses the word members, it's more than just a body part. There's a deeper meaning spiritually. Back to the brain versus the mind. The brain functions, listen to me, work with me here. This is illustrative. The brain functions like a processor in a computer. Work with me. 
For the human, separate from God, it's the highest level of functioning. A person that is not born again, that does not have the Holy Spirit, the brain activity is the highest level of functioning. However, at the same time, the brain is not exactly the mind. Work with me. The brain is an amazing network of neural tissue. It's a vast system of neurons. That are like electrical wires connected to nerves, responding to chemicals in the brain. That's why psych drugs elevate your norepinephrine, they elevate your serotonin, they elevate your dopamine, and they make you feel better, but it ain't really fixing nothing. It's a counterfeit, it's a facade, but that's another story. So at this level, these they're like these neurons are like wires connected to nerves and they respond to chemicals in the brain, creating and carrying impulses through the central nervous system, which is your brain and your spinal cord. And then these signals are released into your peripheral nervous system. Talking about your hands and your feet and all of the things that you need to function. It's an amazing thing what God has put together. Amazing. Hallelujah. These signals are dispersed to the periphery, and which is our external body. Here's the illustration, brain and body. I want to open the door. I use this illustration all the time. I want to open the door, but we're not talking spiritually right now. We're talking physically. I want to open the door. The chemicals in my brain create a task. The task is sent as a signal through my central nervous system. And from there into the periphery, and my eyes lead the way. My feet bring me to the door, and voila, my hand opens the door. That's just basic brain function. That's how it happens. You don't have to even think about that stuff. I want to open the door. Boom, there I go. I do it, right? Didn't really take a whole lot of high-level intellect to pull that off, right? Now, here's another illustration. We're going to add a spiritual element. Mind and members. Mind and members. See, I want to excite my flesh now. This is an example. I know you don't want to excite your flesh. You came here to excite your spirit because you love Jesus. So we're not here to excite our flesh, but there's an example. Let's just say I'm struggling or I'm living in failure. I want to excite my flesh. So, so now what I'm going to do when I want to, because it, why would you want to do that? Because it feels good. It hadn't gotten bad yet. So I want to open a spiritual door. To see what's on the other side. My brain is controlling all the somatic. You know that word soma? Y'all heard of that word for other reasons. That word soma literally means body in the Greek. So there's a whole thing. So it controls this part of my body. And, and so my brain controls all these functions. But then there's another level. The mind has its own will. I need you to understand that. The mind has its own will. It's different than just your brain function. Now we're adding something else to it, right? And it wants to do something. And, it's, and yes, it's directly related to the sinful nature. The sinful nature, though, is supposed to be dormant in the life of the Christian. Can I get an amen? amen. Can I get an amen? amen. The, the proper order of the sinful nature is that it's gone night-night. It's not supposed to be awake. It's supposed to be sleep. It's supposed to be dead in Christ. It's not eradicated, but it's supposed to be. Hallelujah. I wanted to find something that rhyme. It's supposed to be, it ain't supposed to be active. Thank you, deactivated. Not eradicated, but deactivated. There we go. Hallelujah. So, the sinful nature is supposed to be dormant. So why is it that so many believers that even know the message of the cross still struggle with their with our precious little sins? Is it unbelief? Is it ignorance? Is it rebellion? Is it demonization? Or is it all of the above? <laughs> it's probably a little bit of all of the above. That, that is another topic for another time. Right now, I'm, e I'm, I'm not even necessarily talking about a believer versus a non-believer. I'm simply trying to differentiate the different functions of brain and body versus mind and members so I can set a context to better reveal the difference between soul and spirit. So my finger turns on the computer because I'm not, that's the door I'm opening. I'm just letting you know. My finger turns on the computer. My hand guides the mouse where my mind tells it to go. My mind now is telling my finger what page to click on. That my mind and my will 
my mind and my will, my soul is now telling and navigating me to telling me where to go. Whatever my body does afterwards, we're just going to turn that little computer off. We're going to forget that image. Let's just turn that off. Let's move on to the next illustration. We're talking about suke, right? I told y'all this before. I'm not teaching you psychology. I'm teaching you psychology. So if you were going to spell suk, the word soul, if you were going to turn it into English letters, the word soul in the Greek language is literally suke. Now, they don't have a Y in Greek. I know I keep doing that. Right? And, and I probably, y'all getting, getting tired of it, but we got some new people tonight. So that's where we get the word psyche. Isn't that interesting? Oh, it's so interesting because, see, they're trying to fix something that's wrong with a pill. They're trying to fix something that's wrong with a pill. When in reality, that pill ain't going to fix nothing. And we, we could get even deeper into that, but we're not going to get into all that right now. But anyway, we're talking about the suke. The soul of man is part of the inner man, and it's in that association, it's associated with the living part of man. Without a soul and a spirit, you don't have nothing but a clump of flesh. Right? right? Without a soul and a spirit, there's no life in the vessel. It's just, a, just like a pile of clothes on the floor. It, it, it's not necessarily spiritual life. It's just animated life. You're animated. You're alive. You're moving. You're functioning. Have you ever seen people before where they almost look like zombies? Like, it looks like their spirit is dead. They're just functioning. And they're barely just even able to go through the motions. I don't know about you, but I think I've been there before. So, it's an aspect of man. It's not necessarily spiritual life, but just the physical functioning aspect of life. Therefore, the soul's primary function, work with me, while on earth, is its connection to the natural or earthly realm. I'm about to prove it to you in scripture. Okay. So the soul is connected to the earthly realm. The members or body parts touch the world. And hold it. And this is a big word. But listen. But the conceptual elements. Those things that shape our thoughts. Our mindsets. Like. Let's work with me here. Like music. Okay. Knowledge. Images. You can't pick up music and drink it. But it filters somehow, some kind of way, it gets into your inner man and it's going through your soul. It's affecting your mind. It starts to affect your thoughts, these things, these images. It doesn't, listen, if I'm dehydrated and I need water, I don't even need my soul. If I have access to water. I just need my brain and my body. I'm thirsty, I got water. Brain tells hand, pick up water, drink water. If I want to drink Fiji water, though, I have to engage my soul because it's a higher level of thinking through. Why do you want Fiji? Well, I heard it's 8.5. Well, why do you care about 8.5? Because alkaline water is better than acidic water. Well, why? They got all kinds of alkaline waters. Why you got Fiji? Because all the cool girls drink Fiji. <laughs> I'm just clowning. I know that. If y'all drink Fiji, that's all. What I'm, that's a whole, that opens up a whole other ball of life. Why are you so worried about what the cool girls drink? But anyway, we won't go there. But you understand what I'm trying to say. The brain first, and now, and but we're engaging the, the physical realm, and our soul is connected to this physicality, okay? And it doesn't require sometimes a higher level of understanding. And now let's, let's look at a couple of other scriptures. I want you to see the, these scriptures. Uh, well, look, I'm going to just tell you about it. So it says, it, it, the natural mind, the natural man, cannot receive the things of God. Right? That's 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. The natural man cannot receive the things of God, sukikos, because they are spiritually understood. So the natural man who is not saved, but can I ask you a question? Can spiritual people still operate in the natural? Absolutely. We'll get into that in a second. Is that God's will? No. So the natural man cannot receive the things of God. That's sukikos. That's the natural man. The soul man. I'm not talking about the movie. But the soul man. Soulish man. He's operating from his soul. It's natural. There's actually one of the scriptures. It's in James chapter 3. I'll go ahead and well, I'm going to just tell you. It's translated as sensual. 
It, because not sensual in the sense of like that, but sensual because your senses engage the physical world you live in. It says it's earthly. Human wisdom is not from above. It's sensual. It's really devilish because the things of this world are fallen. And, the, and if it's not of the spirit, then it's not of the Lord. Right. Amen. And so, so that's Sukikos. But listen, there's also another scripture where it says, later on it says, you're carnal. We just, re we just read about that. That's Sarkikos. Because it comes off of Sark, which means flesh. That's the carnal man. All of these things are still interconnected. Listen, this is separate from the spirit is the point I'm trying to make. Trying to, and, and, and this is the thing. Well, but, but Paul said, but you're not carnal. Because listen, there's a whole bunch of scriptures in Romans chapter 8 that says that the, the let's go ahead and let's take a look at Romans chapter 8. Romans 8. Verse 3. This is the Strong's. That the righteousness of the law. Let's just keep going right here. I don't know, this is not where I wanted to be. Look, for they that are after the flesh. I'm going to. I'm going to go to the NASB. It's a literal translation. For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who are according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. The mind is part of your soul. So your mind can think about fleshly things. Or your mind can be set upon spiritual things, right? So the soul by itself is not bad. God wants to use your soul for his purposes. He just don't want your soul or my soul getting in his way. Does that make sense? All right. See, because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God. For it does not subject itself to the law of God. For it is not even able to do so. All right. Now, real quick. In times past, whenever we would teach on what it means to walk in the spirit. Anybody want to throw their hand out there and say, what does it mean to walk in the spirit? You can if you want. You don't have to. I'm just asking. What does it mean to walk in the spirit? There was a time that I've taught it for many, for many years. And there's a truth to it. That to walk in the spirit means to keep faith focused and anchored on what Jesus Christ did for you at the cross. And we were talking about the difference between faith in Christ and what he accomplished versus faith in a set of rules, regulations, or a works-based Christianity. We've talked about that for many years. Can I tell you that's more than that? To walk in the Spirit means to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. Amen. How is it that a Christian can understand the message of the cross? And I'm just saying When somebody cuts out in traffic, like Angie said, you might give them the finger. Or you might say a choice word. Your face might turn red, or like I used to do, you're horny. <laughs> For quite some time. And you get real close behind them and let them know. It's almost like going into road rage and hoping that they will stop. Now, I don't know that that's a good idea. <laughs> Or somebody irritates you at work. And the next thing you know, you say some word other than hallelujah. Oh, glory. <laughs> right? I've been listening to Brother Bill and Brother Kirk. I'm just telling you, that's what I've been saying. That's like, hallelujah. Oh, glory. Yeah. Fill me up, Lord. Fill me up. Use me. Come on, Jesus. Darling of heaven, but no, I said something else. And then I acted like it wasn't even a big deal. No, that's carnal, my friend. That is carnal. That's fleshly. Why you know the message of the cross and your, crew, your members are supposed to be crucified and why you ain't got no control over your unruly tongue like James said, oh, it's unruly. Men can steer big old ships with a little bitty rudder but he can't seem to get control of his tongue. Lord, Amen. help us. So if I'm over here cussing, Instead of glorifying when the times get tough. Because Jesus said this. He said, in this world, you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. You can expect troublesome times to come. You ain't supposed to be saying bad words. You're supposed to be giving glory to Jesus. Come on. Help the preacher out. 
Don't get mad when he starts telling the truth. Oh, help us. So the carnal mind is hostile towards the things of God. It cannot please God. All right, here we go. We're going to do, do this little, we're going to do this uh, illustration. I still want to talk about the difference between the intellect of an atheist, you know, intellect versus, and then we're going to move through. We're going to, we're going to get out of here in a good time. Y'all, y'all with me still? Yes. Illustration of music. Here's music. From the perspective of an intellectual atheist. I'm using this as a case study. You know why I'm using this? Because I've literally been in conferences before where I had to take psych classes and I would ask them, hey, y'all mind if I say something that y'all might think is crazy? What if there's something connected to some of this music and what if there's something connected to something spiritual going on with these girls and these people that cut themselves? Oh, what are you talking about? I, can I let you in a little secret? People have been cutting themselves long before Marilyn Manson ever showed up. The man of Gathering was cutting himself. That's right. The prophets of Baal were cutting yep. themselves. Yes. Hello! Y'all yep. thought that this was just some new little thing? No. This stuff been around. And so I asked them, and they're like, yeah, yeah, maybe. Yeah, shut up. <laughs> You're messing up our Prozac moment. Right? <laughs> So here's the illustration, and look, it's an intellectual atheist. Here's the case study. A young girl, and listen, I did my own little case study. I asked about five different ones when I see the scars on their arms. What kind of music do you listen to? Three out of the five said Black Veil Brides. Is that a true statistical analysis? No, I don't even know who Black Veil Brides are, but I Googled them right there in the room, and I'm like, well, Lord, help us. No wonder. You're over here receiving this stuff into your spirit. I did watch a video one time about Marilyn Manson, and he said that these lyrics are explicit. Raise your children or else I will. One of his songs was, I throw my teenage fit and I cut my, no, I throw my little fit and I cut my teenage wrist. He's, so here's a case study. A young girl is an atheist and she just likes Marilyn Manson, dude. Get off of her, man. <laughs> She just likes his music. What's the big deal? She, I don't believe in God. She doesn't believe in God. She doesn't believe in demons. I don't believe in the afterlife. I'm an intellectual being, and when I die, I will become dirt. And my will is that I want to listen to Marilyn Manson. So I'm going to take my will and do what I want. So my brain creates a task. My hand engages the device. The sound waves enter the air. And I bring the music from the outside world into my brain through my ears, where it processes through the filter of my soul as it engages my mind, and now it begins to influence my thoughts. Right. From there, thoughts of depression start to pervade my mind. Suicide begins to, begins to enter in. The words to the song infiltrate and dig deeper. She has friends now, but we're not going to talk about that. So, and, they, and, and, they, and they start to dig deeper. And, 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 but but what, you're just going to keep it spiritual. But no, let, let me just say this. My question to the smart doctor would be this. Sir... If the demons aren't real, why did that happen? Why did she cut herself? This is, would be his intellectual response, I think. It might be. I can't say. I postulate that it's power of suggestive thought. She thought, so she did. Never will they imagine that they're playing with spiritual problems. And they'll say, take Prozac, come back and see me in a month. And when the medicine doesn't work for any more than two weeks, they're going to change her. They're going to add other things. And they're going to continue to go on the medication merry-go-round. When the reality of it is, she's playing around with stuff. That's it, and she's inviting things into her life. And it ain't just Marilyn Manson, dude. That's major stuff right there. I'll admit it to you. But it don't even take that, my friend. All it takes is a love song. And you go pick up some dude in a bar room. And you keep sleeping. And transference of spirits is taking place. And the next thing you know, you can can't even get free. Oh, Lord, help us. I got one that can set you free. His name is Jesus, and he died on the cross, and that's what he came to do. Yeah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. But that's the unregenerate man. Me, because she didn't believe. Titus 3 5, I told y'all about that earlier. It says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but through the regeneration, hallelujah, of the Holy Spirit and the renewal of the Holy Spirit. Regenerate. New life. He offers new life, my friend. He does a spiritual renovation. The Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside. Now he's alive to God. Hallelujah. So. <laughs> But why is it, why is the new believer end up being like a two year old child? I don't know where this came from. In a sandbox, pl 
playing with a dead possum carcass that stinks. Mm. What, and can you see a two-year-old doing something goofy like that? What are you playing with? Oh, my God. Dude, what are you, get away from that. Why, if he's alive to God, does he still meddle with sin? And let's get off the sin kick for a second. No, really. Why on earth, when the Spirit of God that created heaven and earth and lives in his vessel, would he depend on his own logic? We ain't talking about sin no more. We done, we done threw sin out the door. Now y'all can take a deep breath. We ain't talking about sin no more. Why in the world, when now you done got saved and the Holy Spirit lives in your heart and in your life, would you depend on your own logic and intellect when you got the voice of the Spirit? Right? I'm talking to myself right now, son. Oh, man. <laughs> man, right? The Holy Spirit speak. Yes. We have access to the voice of God. That is the purpose of this teaching. Amen? But before I move forward, I want to say this. Let me give you an example from my own life. Some of y'all know this to be true because I shared it with you. About nine months ago, I even told Wayne, I'm like, hey, man, I'm about to try to fix this house up, dude, because I think I'm going to use this house. I'm going to borrow some money. I'm about to start me a clinic. Oh, yeah. No longer somebody else is packing you, baby. I'm about to get paid. But guess what? It's even better than that. I'm about to call this thing Liberty Clinic. Got to have an American flag out front. And as soon as you walk in, the first thing you're going to see is a big old scripture. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Hallelujah. You'll walk into room one, no longer slaves to sin. You'll walk into room two. Look, I was thinking, I was telling y'all earlier, we have a room with Lily over there. We don't have no pros out and we'll put you over there. You need deliverance ministry. We got a prayer room over here. We'll lay hands on you. We will pray for you. Brothers and sisters, we'll let Brother Kirk come up in there. Jessica, everybody. Pray healing hands on you. I still want some medicine, okay? We'll give you the medicine, but we're going to pray for it. Yeah. Hallelujah. That was a good thought. Yeah. It's a good idea, man. Yeah. Sometimes ideas are good, but that doesn't mean that they're always God. Yeah. I wanted to remind you the Spirit lives with your spirit. Hallelujah. My will, God's will. Look, I'm going to go ahead and build this up for you a little bit. See, God lives in my spirit with the Holy Spirit. The soul is my mind, my will, my emotions. This whole little thing I had going on, I realize now, at least at that time, it was more my soul talking about that. Oh, it was going to be good, my friend. You was going to get treated right. I was going to take care of folks. And I mean it. And, I, and I've been praying for people for 20 years in the clinic. So that was just going to be just now I got more freedom. But sometimes things are good, but they're not God. See, before the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they only knew God. Now we got good and evil. Yep, right. yes. And in my mind, I got good and evil. Right. And sometimes I think I'm doing something good, but in reality, the Holy Spirit's trying to speak to me. But I'm like, oh no. See, the Lord wants me to prosper. Yes. And He does. He wants us to prosper. Even in the, the, with the third letter of John, He said, I pray, my beloved, that, you're, that, you're, that you prosper even as your soul prospers. That's right. God's a God of prosperity. But boy, I tell you what, you hold on that prosperity word a little too long, next thing you know, you start shucking and jiving and operating in your soulish realm, in your own mindset, and maybe not even asking the Lord's opinion about how he wants you to handle your business. Yeah. Right? And it'll start influencing our decisions. Look, real quick, I just want to need I remind you of our brother Lot. <laughs> Y'all remember our brother Lot? Okay, so what happened? Look, Abraham said, listen, I don't want there to be any strife between you and me. Dude, that is so beautiful when you can find New Testament theology in the Old Testament. Strife is a lust of the flesh. Our brother Abraham was operating according to the fruit of the Spirit. And he said, brother, listen, we're, we be brethren. Oh, I think Abraham 2,000 years ago had a word for us. We be brethren. Why we got all this strife going on between us? Anyway, we be brethren. You go either to the left, to the right. You go where you want to go. And guess what? I'll go the other way. Because the Lord's just blessing us so much. Our brother Lot, and he was our brother. The word of God tells us that he was a believer. 
Listen, our brother Lot made a logical decision. It had to be a soulish decision. There ain't no way it was a spiritual decision. Because you know what he did? He used his eyes and he looked at the, the valley of Jordan and he saw that the valley was well watered and he's a herdsman. He got animals he got to feed. So what? it makes sense to the logical mind. Right. And listen, I'm not trying to get messy up in here, but I've shared it before and it's not just women, it's men too. I haven't seen single women through the years of being a Christian and in their logical mind, they think they're going to fix their situation by marrying a man. And I got to tell you right now, sometimes, dude, if that is your soul that figured that out, dude, bad decision. Bad, bad decision. No, the Bible does say it. It says that a man that finds a wife finds a good thing. I didn't see the scripture where it says a woman. That's a shame. But there are good men, and especially if he's a man of God. So I'm not trying to make fun of that. There are good men, and it's not always the man. Come on. Sometimes these women can be something else, right? Right? I'm just being real, right? We know, I know men are a mess. I'm one. All right? But this is the thing. We think, and we make a logical decision. It makes sense. It's just the right thing to do. I'm going to give me a man. No, that was a bad move, dude. You got to wait on the Holy Spirit. You got to wait on his timing. You got to listen to his voice. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so that's what Lot did, though. It makes sense. I got it. I got it. I got to feed the animals. So what does he do? He pitches his tent towards Sodom. And, and you know what the word of God says in the New Testament? Lot vexed his righteous soul. Lot vexed, second Peter, the letter, the second, the, the second letter that Peter wrote to the church. Lot vexed his righteous soul by putting himself in the middle of all of that corruption and pollution. His eyes looked at all that. His ears heard it. He wasn't a partaker in it. He wasn't doing it. He was around it and it vexed his soul. Help us. And we do the same thing. I'm just being honest with you, bro. I mean, I don't know why I said bro. I'm just being honest with you. Like really. I don't know. I, I never really did a lot of partying since I've been in Morgan City. Hallelujah. Showed up at my sister's house one night. I was a mess. She said, we're going to church. I got saved that night. I messed up a little bit. I've messed up. Okay, but I'm just saying, like, I didn't keep living the party life. But there used to be some place called the Rat or something, the Rat Skeller or something like that. That probably would have been the place I've been hanging out. I'm just saying, dude, you go up in the Rat, and I, Lord only knows what they're playing up in there. they singing some songs that ain't too good for your soulish man. And they got all kinds of shenanigans going on in there. But, and here, here we say, oh, but I'm a child of God. Okay, well, you're vexing your righteous soul. Right. Yeah. You're vexing your own soul when you put yourself up in the middle of that stuff. Yeah. And listen, can I, be, can I be a little bit more clean about it? But tell you the truth, we sit there and we look at all this social media stuff. What are you trying to say? You want me to become a monk? <laughs> I'm trying to tell you I don't want you to vex your righteous soul. Anything that's going to vex your righteous soul, I'm trying to encourage you to get rid of it. Yeah, yes. Hallelujah. And put something Jesus up in there, man. Yeah, yeah. Let the Holy Spirit have his way. So, so these decisions will be a mess. I mean, I'm just saying, it, well, listen, when we start to let the soul start to influence our decisions, it can affect our daily life decisions. You know, uh, the Holy Spirit had to whittle me down from starting my own clinic to now I'm going to be working part time at somebody else's clinic and I'm happy about it. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> we don't live stream anymore. Well, I'm not going to say any part. I'm not. But anyway, the Lord revealed something else to me about that whole thing when we went to that one accord service that was just like, wow. And it was, a, it was so good. It was so good. <laughs> I don't get the benefit of it other than being able to cry out to my king for another soul. What a benefit. What a privilege. Huh? That's a privilege. I put all, this, all that other stuff in the, in the hands of my Lord and let him take care of the rest. But I mean, look at all these things. Your job, your spouse, your school, your tithes. I mean, we can let our soul. Like, I'm just saying, like you'd be walking in Walmart. I was talking to somebody the other day. And, and it was like, do you believe that the Lord can grow appendages? I want to believe, but my logical mind, if I'm not careful, will try to convince me that that's just too big. No, it ain't. No, it's not. 
Hey, God, God created the heaven and the earth and all that in them is. An appendage like you got one leg and then all of a sudden, whoop, now you got two. Hallelujah. God can grow limbs, my friend. He can reverse a stroke. He can reverse heart damage. God can heal the sick. He can set the captive free. There's nothing too big for my God. Hallelujah. But if my soul gets in the way, I'm like, oh, man, that's a big one. I'm going to look like a dummy if he doesn't do it. No. Because he might, might do it on purpose like three weeks later when you ain't even looking. But if he told you to do it, hallelujah. I'm just preaching to myself, man. Miracles. I don't want my soul to get in the way. You get the point. Yes. My will can suppress the will of God. Yes. I don't want my will to suppress the will of God. Oh, no. I don't want my will to be bigger than the Holy Spirit. I want the Holy Spirit to be big. You see there? Now the Holy Spirit's big. And look, he's influencing my soul. You know what? Listen, I used to say this a lot. I used to say God wants us to use our brain. Today, laying in my bed studying, I was like, No! Stop the presses. No, he doesn't. He does not want me to use my brain. He wants me to let him use my brain. Yeah. That's what the Holy yeah. Spirit wants. He wants Matt Bear to let him use my brain. It's not that he doesn't use my mind. It's not that he, he wants to use my mind to cause it to line up with his will so that my, my will will surrender to his will. And guess what happens? What's that third thing in the trifecta? Emotions. I wonder if, huh, I wonder if, if my mind lined up with his mind and my will lined up with his will, if all of a sudden, all that emotional chaos oh, would start to fix itself. I wonder if all the anxiety, all the depression, all the, all the lies that the enemy tries to throw on me. I mean, I'm not saying you're not still going to have a battle, my friend, but I'm just trying to say, I wonder if I would line up with the will of the Lord, hallelujah, and my emotions would even start to get right. So listen, we're going to go through this real quick. The written word. If you love me, keep my commandments. Hallelujah. Look at, look at, what, this, look at what John said. And hereby, this is 1 John 2, 3-5. through 5, Hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. And so the person says, oh, but look, if we keep his commandments. So the person says this, but his commandments, come on, preacher, what you talking about? We don't live in the law. Look, I'm just drawing a quick arrow. Look, word. If we keep his word, the commandments are his word. It's the word of God. He wants us to be true to all of his word. He says, I know him. He that says, I know him and keeps not his commandments. Oh, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. Listen, I just want to encourage you. Don't get beat down. That's not what I'm trying to do. Ain't none of us walking in sinless perfection. As a matter of fact, let me add this one. Well, let me say this first. Jesus prayed. I already read, quoted this to you. I will pray the Father, he will give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth, the world cannot receive him because it sees him not. Neither does it know him, but you know him for he dwells with you and he shall be in you. This is the thing. The Holy Spirit, God is not asking us to keep his word or his commandments in our own strength. He sent the Holy Spirit to live in us, to strengthen us so that we can obey the will of God. Amen. And, and so now we're getting into the whispered word. Because look, it's a beautiful thing. And we will start to obey the written word. Next thing you know, the God of glory will start to speak to your heart. Man, that is a privilege. Huh? Yeah. To think that the voice of God. Have y'all ever had the, y'all think I'm cuckoo out there? You, oh, God talks to you? Mm -hmm. Sure, wink, wink. No, yeah, yeah, you better believe me. Yeah. It's a whisper. Amen. See, this word right here in 1 John 2, 20 says you have an unction. The word in the Greek is chrisma. It means to be smeared with oil. You have an unction. Look at this. Other translations call it the anointing. You have an anointing from the Holy One and you know the truth. The Holy Spirit lives on the inside of you. And if you will allow him to speak, you will know the truth. Look at this. I wanted to say this. See, what this sin 
for Jessica today may not be sin for you today. You know why? Because maybe you don't know that it's sin. But in three days from now, she might tell you something. I'm saying, I'm using her. I'm not trying to pick on her. I use somebody else. Pamela. Pamela might say something to you. And then all of a sudden, three days later, the Holy Spirit whispers it to your spirit, reveals it to you. And then the next thing you know, lo and behold, you go into Word, and there it is right there. Because the Holy Spirit will never whisper anything that's not already written. Or at least the heart of the Scripture. Right? But therefore, to him that knows to do good and doesn't do it, to him it is sin. No, the Word of God is clear. Sin is sin. Holiness and righteousness is holiness and righteousness. And when the Spirit reveals what is sin and we don't obey, now it's sin because we know it's sin. The Lord has revealed it. Look at this. 1 Kings 19, 12. This is the prophet Elijah. After the earthquake of fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. After the fire, the sound of a low whisper. The Holy Spirit wants to whisper. He wants to speak to us. And when he does, he wants us to listen. I hadn't heard from the Lord in a while. What good does it do the Lord to speak if we don't listen? I love this one. 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 10. Then the Lord came and stood and called as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, little boy, and his little priestly ephod, little cute, dressed up, his mom made him a little ephod. He says, speak for your servant is listening. I've been praying that. Somebody shared that with me recently that they prayed that. And, and listen, I've been praying that. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. I want to listen. I want to listen to the Holy Spirit. I'm telling you, I'm, I'm, Lord, give me grace to listen, to yield, to surrender. That's my problem. That's all of our problems. Amen. When we have problems, it's because we're not surrendering. We're not yielding. He's already done it. He already went to the cross. He ain't going back again, my friend. He already went to the cross. He prayed to the Father. The Comforter has come. You receive by faith. The Holy Spirit lives in your heart. Hallelujah. He's speaking. He wants us to listen. Yes. But look at Jonah. Do I need to remind you of our brother Jonah? <laughs> the Lord gave him a ticket to Nineveh. <laughs> But Jonah rose up to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. That's good. Help us, Lord. Jeremiah 17, 23. Musicians, singers, you can come. We're about to worship the Lord out of this place. Amen. Some of us are going to stay late and worship for a while. However that looks, you're welcome to stay with us. We, as a matter of fact, we want to encourage it. I feel like the more we seek the face of God, the more the Spirit moves. But I understand if you have other, you know, it's late already. Jeremiah 17, 23. Yet they did not listen or incline their ear. See, I told you, God's used to this. It's sad, but he is. He's used to his people not listening. How it must please him when his people begin to listen. Huh? Yet they did not listen or incline their ear, but stiffen their neck that they might not hear and receive instruction. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would have your way with us tonight.